We may believe that we know all there is to know about ancient secrets, that nothing new can be discovered. But nothing could be further from the truth. We will investigate the origins of civilization in the tales of Adam and Eve. We will move through the heavens with ancient concepts of astronomy and unravel sacred symbols such as the Ark. We will visit pyramids and ancient round towers and connect to harmonic frequencies discovered and utilized by our ancestors. And through these, we will discover the amazing secrets that our ancestors knew and that subsequent generations have forgotten. We will see how the authorities hid and destroyed evidence and further darkened our vision of the past. But we will finally reveal the sacred secrets that shine a light on the true reality of our very existence. Welcome to the Top 10 Ancient Secrets. Across time, there is one little animal, both physical and metaphysical, which persistently crops up, the snake or serpent. There are literally thousands of interpretations given to the symbolism of the snake that we find in ancient texts, artworks, sculptures and structures, and yet they can all be traced to one root source. This is our first and most impressive of the top 10 ancient secrets because it is still, to this day, denied by a jealous church. In the first place, we should understand that the snake is the physical, slithering creature we see around the world, whereas the serpent is the mystical, mythological and metaphysical aspect of the same thing. To begin, we should also understand the root of the word and other related words that give us the various terms around the globe for serpent or snake. The snake is known in the language of Canaan variously as Ob, Ab, Ub, Ob, Of, Op, Ef and Ev. Amazingly, in the Mayan language, Can means serpent, as in Kukulkan, the bird serpent. And just as in the ancient Sumerian Akan and the Scottish Can for serpent. Vulcan, the Roman god of fire, comes from the Babylonian Can for serpent and vol for fire, showing an etymological link across thousands of miles. Indeed, even the very centre of the Christian world, the Vatican, comes from the word vatis for prophet and can for serpent, making the Vatican a place of serpent prophecy. The oracle that the biblical king Saul appealed to for prophecy was called one that hath ob or the priestess of Ob, the snake. The snake worshippers of Moses' time and area were known as Hivites, derived from Hivia or serpent, the root of Eve. Hivites became Ophites, the early Christian Gnostic serpent worshippers who claimed affinity with the Christians in the second century AD. Indeed, the very children of Israel intermarried with them and served their gods. They were also known as Baalim from Baal. Baal was a solar god thought to be an abbreviation of Ob El, the serpent god or shining serpent. The shining aspect of the serpent reveals a subtle clue. On the one hand, the shining was the illumination believed to have been achieved when under altered states of consciousness and wherein one sees serpents. The world over. This is of course not true enlightenment, as our ancestors readily pointed out that true illumination derived from knowledge of one's own soul and knowledge of the greater work of the gods. This leads us to the other knowledge, the stars. In literal truth, the serpent was indeed seen in the sky, which shone down upon us. This is why in Egypt, for instance, we will see the sun, or Aten, wrapped with the snake and why the serpent was worldwide seen as a symbol of the sun. Getting back to Baal, we find that the 20th century writer and historian Bryant remarked that the Greeks called him Beliar, which was interpreted to mean 
a dragon or great serpent. Bel is the Assyrio-Babylonian version of the gods Enlil and Marduk, being the same as Baal. The same Baal seen throughout the Bible. So the Baal in the Bible is a Babylonian serpent god. Could it be that Beltane should be rendered Beltan? Both words signifying the dragon or serpent and showing again a cross-continent link to Europe. Remember that this was a time of year associated with the sun and the serpent is again here being linked to these astrotheological concepts. In fact, Tanit or Tanit was a patron goddess of Carthage in northern Africa who was also associated with the tree of life like Ishtar and Astarte and she definitely crossed cultures into Europe. Often the tree is depicted with wavy lines said to represent serpents emerging in symbolic form. The name Tanit means serpent lady and she is found on many coins in Carthage associated with the Caduceus and symbolizing the role of Tanit in life, death and rebirth. She is basically the same as the Queen of Heaven, Astarte or Isis and Mary. Here the serpent is associated with the cycles of the moon as the Queen of Heaven, whereas the male serpent is the King of Heaven, the Sun, the one being the mirror of the other. This relates the early Christian Gnostics right back to Babylonian beliefs of serpent worship, which in turn goes across to Egypt and Mesopotamia, in general towards the African ancient serpent cults. Christianity then is related to the most ancient serpent worship known, and if it were not for the destructive covering up of huge amounts of historical data by the Christians, then this would have been all the more obvious. It is a fact that the Christians were ashamed of this link and did all they could to destroy it. Not least because it revealed their own deity to be the sun itself. A general term used for early Christian Gnostics was Ophites, although it is probably too strong to call them Christians in the modern sense. Epiphanius said, the Ophites sprung out of the Nicolaitans and Gnostics and were so called from the serpent which they worshipped. They taught that the ruler of this world was of a dracontic form, and the Ophites attribute all wisdom to the serpent of paradise and say that he was the author of knowledge of men. They keep a live serpent in a chest, and at the time of the mysteries entice him out by placing bread before him upon a table. Opening his door, he comes out and having ascended the table, folds himself around the bread. They not only break the bread and distribute this among the votaries, but whosoever will may kiss the serpent. This, the wretched people, call the Eucharist. They conclude the mysteries by singing a hymn, through him, to the Supreme Father. An amazing declaration which speaks volumes. It tells us that, like the ancient Egyptians, the serpent was symbolic of the sun and must constantly entice to rise. Kissing the bread is a simple revelation that the sun indeed feeds us by giving life to our agricultural world. The Eucharist mediator is the serpent, as Christ was the mediator on the cross, a symbol and act more ancient than Christ and rooted itself in serpent worship. The serpent was itself sacrificed on the sacred tree or Asherah. This also relates to the Roman rites of Bacchus, where snakes were carried in baskets of cakes and bread, the food being given to the votaries. In these Bacchanalian rites, there was also the consecrated wine, which was handed around. Remarkably, this ritual used a special chalice or grail, called the Cup of the Agatha Demon, simply meaning Good Serpent. This serpent consecrated cup of wine was handed around after supper, just like the Last Supper of Christ, and was received with much shouting and joyousness. The hymn sung by the serpent to the Supreme Father was just the same as the one sung in the memory of the Python at Delphi on the seventh day of the week. 
Now, thousands of years later, Christians still take the cup of Christ, called the Good Serpent by the Gnostics, and eat the consecrated bread. This modern ritual is none other than the original, but renamed, Cup of the Sacred Serpent, which gives the body and blood of our oldest god. A third century Persian teacher known as Manes, who said that Christianity had got things wrong and he was here to put it right, attempted to revive these old ways. Regardless of the Christian attempts to kill off Manichaeism, it survived until the 13th century. He is said to have revived Ophir Latreia, or serpent worship, where he taught that Christ was the incarnation of the great serpent, who glided over the cradle of the Virgin Mary when she was asleep at the age of a year and a half. But the worship of the serpent was much more ancient than even Manes stated. The chief title of the British serpent god was Hu, the dragon ruler of the world. The title probably giving us Hyas, a name for Bacchus. The druid was known as a Nada, now known as an Adder, and the Adder was the symbol of the god Hu. It is believed that the druids were Ophites of the original stock. They worshipped also Beli, so in this respect the druids were probably the last truly serpent-worshipping priests in Europe. According to Herodotus, a sacred serpent was fed honey cakes once a month at the Acropolis in Athens. These honey cakes were marked with the Omphalus. The superstition of the Omphalus was widespread, like the serpent belief, from India to Greece. It is a boss, or orb, with spiral lines through to represent serpents coiled. These are similar markings on ancient stone monuments across the world, especially at New Grange in Ireland. Quintus Curtius also pointed out that in Africa there were such stones with spiral lines, said to be a symbol of their serpent deity. To the Etruscans, the Omphalus was seen as a route to the underworld. It was placed in a trench called a mundus or earth, and the first fruits offered into the trench, which was then covered by a huge stone. The entire city was centred on this spot, with all roads leading to and from it. In Greek history, the Delphic Oracle was called Pytho, and she was active for over 1,000 years, getting involved in anything from Monday day-to-day -day prophecies to matters of state. Nobody really has any ideas how the Oracle managed to do her business. There are suggestions that volcanic vents issued hallucinogenic chemicals up into the chamber, and suggestions that sacred mushrooms were used. One strange vase, however, may give the clue. A 4th century Volki cup shows King Aegeus before Pythia, who holds a bowl and stares intently into it. There is no vented drug or mushroom. This is the sacred cup of the Agatha demon, in another form. The prophetic snake yet again. It may also be that this was a unique way of seeing the reflection of the sky, and thereby predicting events from astrological perspectives. As throughout the history of the mystical serpent, it has been associated with powers of future sight, known to us today as precognition. Around the decoration of this cup are the familiar spirals of the snake, and Pythia herself is seated upon the tripod, sacred to the sight. Another indication that the serpent is associated strongly with prophecy is the stark fact that the words for divination in Hebrew, Arabic and Greek all mean serpent. This alone indicates that Hebrew, Arabic and Greek are following the same beliefs over a vast period of time. According to Ferguson, the 19th century writer, when we first meet with serpent worship, either in the wilderness of Sinai, the groves of Epidaurus, or in the Sarmatian huts, the serpent is always the Agatha demon, which in ancient Egypt presided over the affairs of men as the guardian spirit of their houses, was the asp of Rano, the snake-headed goddess who represented as nursing the young princess. That the idea of health was intimately associated with the serpent is shown by the crown formed of the asp, or sacred 
Thamusis, having been given particularly to Isis, a goddess of life and healing, and according to Hargrave Jennings in Ophir Latreia, these were no doubt intended to symbolise eternal life. It was the symbol of other deities with likewise attributes. In the Serpent and Shiva worship by C. Staniland Wake, he remarks about the Muslim saint of Upper Egypt is still thought to appear under the form of a serpent and to cure the diseases which afflict the pilgrims of his shrine. In the same book, we hear of Ramahavali, one of the four idols of Madagascar, whose emissaries are serpents. He is regarded as a physician and thought to expel epidemic diseases, much akin to Aesculapius. As God, sacred, powerful and almighty, who kills and makes alive, who heals the sick and prevents diseases and pestilence, who can cause thunder and lightning to strike their victims or prevent their fatality, can cause rain in abundance when wanted, or can withhold it so as to ruin the crops of rice. He is also celebrated for his knowledge of the past and future, and for his capacity to discover whatever is healed or concealed. Rama Havale has basically all the elements of the Agatha demon, the sacred serpent, in one god. He is, like many other serpent deities, in charge of the weather. He has knowledge and wisdom, and above all, he can heal, resurrect, and disperse disease. In the epigraphic records of cures from Epidorus, there are many methods of healing. The 17th, for instance, states, a man had his toes healed by a serpent. He, suffering dreadfully from a malignant sore on his toe, during the daytime was taken outside by the servants of the temple and set upon a seat. When sleep came upon him, then a snake issued from the abattum and healed the toe with its tongue and therefore went back again to the abattum. Our second ancient secret is the story from Genesis of Adam and Eve. These two people are the biblical progenitors of the whole human race. Remarkably, both are related to serpent worship from their Sumerian origins. Clemens Alexandrius said that the hevia, the root of heave, means female serpent. If we pay attention to the strict sense of the Hebrew, the name hevia, aspirated, signifies a female serpent. It is connected to the same Arabic root which means both life and serpent. The Persians even called the constellation Serpens the little Ava or Eve. In Old Akkadian, Ad signifies father and according to C. Staniland Wake in the origins of serpent worship, Adam was closely associated in legend with Seth, Saturn, Thoth or Tautus, who were all associated strongly as serpents. No wonder that Abel, the son of Adam and Eve, means serpent shining, and that Cain was thought to be of serpent descent. The other and important point to note is that Adam and Eve were initially immortal, and Eve gained her wisdom via the serpent on the tree of knowledge or life. As for Cain and Abel, well, Abel and Cain were names given to elder and younger brothers, and Abel resolves into Ab for snake and El for shining, and therefore is a snake god or shining snake. According to rabbinical tradition, Cain was not the son of Adam at all, but rather the son of Asmodeus, the serpent spirit, who is Harriman in Persian Zoroastrianism. We now move on to our third ancient secret, astronomy. Elements of this ancient science were kept secret for reasons of control. Knowledge of the heavens was not just sacred up to the gods, but also powerful because it aided in navigation. The motion of the planets was seen as serpentine by many cultures. Calendars from Eurasia show representations of the celestial pathway with cycloid movements and serpentine features. The eclipses are shown as one serpent eating another. Mm -hmm. 
Similar serpent formations for the celestial pathways are shown across the world and so it is not surprising to see the serpent represented on the ancient stone monuments of the world which are aligned to various celestial motions such as midsummer and midwinter. In Greek legend, the father of Aesculapius was Apollo, the sun god. He asked his sacred crow, or raven, named Corvus, to go to earth and bring him a cup of fresh spring water. Corvus flew down with a chalice in order to follow his master's instructions. However, by the edge of the water grew a fig tree. The fig is thought to be the tree from the Garden of Eden. The temptation was too much for Corvus to eat the fruit, but it was not ripe and so the bird waited. When the fruit was ripe, Corvus ate his full until the last of the figs had gone. Then he remembered why he was on earth in the first place and quickly filled his goblet. However, he suddenly had a thought that he would need an excuse for taking so long. He grabbed a water snake and together with the cup flew back to Apollo. He told Apollo that the water snake had attacked him, but Apollo saw the tiny snake and refused to believe the bird. He punished Corvus by turning him black, or sent him into the night time, where he had once been a beautiful silvery white. He gave the bird a raucous crow, and then threw Corvus, the snake, and the cup into the sky. Now we can see the cup as crater, and the snake as hydra in the stars. The snake was told to keep the cup on his back, and never to let Corvus near it, the snake becoming the protector of the cup of the water of the gods. Ophiuchus stretches from the east of the head of Hercules to Scorpio and is partly in the Milky Way and divided by the celestial equator. Ophiuchus, the snake handler, and serpents the snake are seen together, the handler holding the snake. The classicists see Ophiuchus as Aesculapius, the healer. To others, Ophiuchus is one of the Libyan Pacilli, who were noted for their skills in curing snake bites, and to still others is Aaron or Moses with their serpent staffs, or Saint Paul with his Maltese viper. Again, the word Ophiuchus comes from Ophis for snake and Chiro, for to handle, sounding remarkably like Chiro, a supposed name for Christ, but a symbol which has much older origins. Serpens, however, is the most unusual constellation in the sky. It is the only one that is split into two parts. The two parts themselves are very telling, as they reveal a distinction between the tail or body and the head of the serpent. Serpens caput is the head of the serpent and serpent's cauda is the tail of the serpent. Even though the two are separated, they are still and uniquely classed as one. The other important point to remember is that Ophiuchus and serpents, thousands of years ago, were actually much larger in the sky than they are today. They had more importance to the ancients than we realise. It is a springtime constellation. It is therefore the constellation of new life. And this leads us nicely to our fourth ancient secret. It is a symbol of life like no other, and has been used by many over the centuries. The Ankh, or Crux Ansata, a simple tea cross surmounted by an oval, called the Rue, which is, simply put, the gateway to enlightenment and new life. It holds all the same symbolic meanings as the cross of Christ. This enigmatic symbol of Egypt represents, quite simply, eternal life, and was often found in the names of pharaohs such as Tut Ankh Amun. The symbol is often depicted being held by a god to a pharaoh, giving him life, or held by a pharaoh to his people, giving them life. This basically set aside the immortals from the mortals, for anyone wearing or carrying the Ankh had gained, or hoped to gain, immortality from the gods of the other world. It is the loop the rue or gateway of the Ankh, which is held by the immortals to the nostrils. It is the same as the biblical God breathing life into the nostrils of Adam. 
It outlived Egyptian domination and was widely used by the Christians as their first cross, but in this symbol holds a clue to the secret of the serpent. The Egyptian god Thoth was said to have symbolised the four elements with a simple cross, which originated from the oldest Phoenician alphabet as the curling serpent. Indeed, Philo adds that the Phoenician alphabet are those forms by means of serpents and adored them by the supreme gods, the rulers of the universe. This bringing to mind the god Thoth, who again is related to the worship of serpents and who created the alphabet. Bunsen in the 19th century thought, the forms and movement of serpents were employed in the invention of the oldest letters which represent gods. This symbol of the four elements was altered slightly and became the Egyptian Taut, the same as the Greek Tau, which is where we get the name Tau cross from, a simple T. The T or Tau cross has been a symbol of eternal life in many cultures and gives it name to the bull in the astrological sign of Taurus. Here are the two elements of the Tau and Ru being brought together. In fact, the Druids or Adders venerated the tree and the snake by scrawling the Tau cross into the tree park and thereby opening up the gateway. In the Middle Ages, the Tau cross was used in amulets to protect the wearer against disease. Among the modern Freemasons, the Tau has many meanings. Some say it stands for the Temple of Jerusalem, others that it signifies hidden treasure or means clavis ad thesaurum, a key to treasure or a place where the precious thing is concealed. It is especially important in royal arch masonry where it becomes the companion jewel with the serpent as a circle above the crossbar, forming the ankh with the Hebrew word for serpent engraved upon the upright and also including the triple tau, a symbol of hidden treasure. It was also the symbol for St Anthony later to become the symbol for the Knights Templar of St Anthony of Leith in Scotland. St Anthony lived in the 4th century AD and is credited with establishing monasticism in Egypt and generally the story goes that he sold all his possessions after hearing from the Lord and marched off into the wilderness to become a hermit. On his travels he learned much from the various sages in Egypt and grew for himself a large following. He was sorely tempted by the devil in the form of creeping things and serpents. In one episode he follows a trail of gold to a temple which is infested with serpents and takes up residence, needing little food for sustenance other than bread and water. He said to have lived 105 years and due to his longevity he is credited with protective powers. The Order of the Hospitallers of St Anthony, who would later take much of the Templar wealth, brought many of Antony's relics to France in the 11th century, although they were said to have been secretly deposited somewhere in Egypt just after his death and later to have found their way to Alexandria. The Taut or Tau symbolises the creating four elements of the universe. Next to the symbol of the sun, serpent, was added a simple circle or oval root. This loop above the T-cross created the Ankh, the symbol of eternity. The snake in a circle eating its own tail is symbolic of the sun and immortality. The symbol of the moon was added to this, turning it into the sign for Hermes or Mercury and showing the caduceus serpent origin. No wonder that this, the most perfect and simple of symbolic devices became the symbol of the early Christians. No wonder that, even though there were no cross-beam crucifixions, Christ was nevertheless symbolically crucified on a symbol of eternal life, a symbol of the serpent and access to life eternal. This symbol became the mark or sign which would set the believer aside for saving. In Ezekiel, this is the mark that God will know the mark on the forehead. As Dean points out, the Ezekiel passage 9.4 should read, set a tau upon their foreheads, or mark with the letter tau their foreheads. The early Christians baptised with the term crucis thalmate notaire, 
they baptised with the symbol of the snake. The idea of this sign or mark is widespread once discovered. In Job 31-35 we read in our modern Bibles, I sound now my defence, let the Almighty answer me, which should properly read, Behold, here is my towel, let the Almighty answer me. He then goes on to say, Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. This remarkable idea of wearing the Tower Cross on the shoulder as a sign would later become part and parcel of the Crusader Templars' markings, the very same Templars who are instigated in the worship of serpents. Also, the Merovingians, said by some to be descended from Jesus and a serpent deity, were also born with a red cross between their shoulder blades. The Tower Cross is also strangely used by those practicing sacred geometry as a marker for buried treasure, whether physical or spiritual. This buried treasure is the gateway and the Tower Cross as a symbol of the serpent and eternal life was the method of access. We now move to our fifth ancient secret, Stargates, for herein lies sacred truths. In his paper, The Great Pyramid Text, Clesson Harvey points out that in the pyramids of Saqqara, there are over 3,000 columns of texts from the 5th and 6th dynasties, which he believes holds the secrets of the pyramid's use. These texts include incantations and magical formula that were obviously invoked in certain locations around the pyramid. However, in one of these pyramids and in the upper passage chamber gallery and shaft is an incredibly old, unmistakable megalithic glyph. Klassen's interpretation that this glyph or phrase translates remarkably into star door and tunnel opening gate. Short of the fact that glyphs are sadly lacking from most pyramids, and the Great Pyramid is an example, this information is a startling discovery. Indeed, there was probably more information which has now been destroyed, as when Herodotus was said to have visited Egypt in the 5th century BC, the outer casing of the Great Pyramid was awash with hieroglyphics. Egyptologists claim that the star is mythological and leave it at that. We, however, will not. Could it be that this tunnel and star door is really the entrance to a shamanic otherworld, as star and shining are intimately linked in meaning, with one having emerged from the trance experience as triggered by the shamanic activity? The star symbol, incidentally, is the five-pointed pentacle and which relates to the head and the whole process of entering the other world and the shaman. Its symbol has remained with us and has remained mysterious ever since. Also, the pentacle is a perfect device for navigation via the moon and the sun. It therefore aids in the location of sacred earth energy. The Egyptians call the area of Giza, where the Great Pyramid is situated, Rostau, meaning gateway to the Duat, or other world. And it was the Rostau effect which could turn a man into a god. It is now time that we took an alternative look at the possible science behind these earth structures. Back in the 70s and 80s, a scientist called Joe Parr decided it was also time to take a look at the Great Pyramid and pyramid shapes in general and what he discovered is nothing short of amazing. In his experiments, Joe set up a model of the pyramid aligned north, south and east, west with flat coils placed on the north and south. A blown one microfarad capacitor was sparked across the gap using a battery, resistor and chart recorder. This was to simulate the electromagnetic energy of the Earth passing over the pyramid, what are commonly known as Earth energies. The scientists registered the changes on a daily basis, recording the bizarre phenomena of energy bubble that surrounded the pyramid. 
Strangely, the energy actually stopped all kinds of radiation and the bubble showed attenuation to beta emitters, ion sources and magnetic sources when in the bubble. Feeding negative ions into the bubble actually intensified the energy. The energy was also found to alter over the course of the year and 13 years of experimentation gave good results. Most peculiar was the effect upon gravity which is linked intrinsically to electromagnetic radiation. It appeared that the bubble actually blocked out the force of gravity as well as electromagnetic energy showing a 113,000 times increase in kinetic energy leading the researchers to theorise that the pyramid actually moved in time and space a place known to theoretical physicists as H-space or hyperspace. Incredibly, when negative ions were fed into the bubble the pyramid was drawn to the moon. Positive ions moved it away. An amazing correlation with the feminine and therefore the spiritually negative aspect associated with lunar worship. But what relevance could this have? Well, if, as it can sometimes misleadingly appear, all things point towards the Great Pyramid, then there has to be a good reason or two. Could it be the Great Pyramid was the world mighty and used as entrance to the shamanic underworld or duat? This seems to have been facilitated by incantations from the pyramid texts and the Book of the Dead, as well as other techniques. The effect caused within the brain, which releases the hormones required for the trance state, is basically electromagnetic and is affected by all manner of ion activity. It therefore appears that the ancient serpent cult were onto this in their own way, perceiving energy as the serpent wave and worshipping this invisible energy god as a snake. Eventually, gathering sufficient knowledge of this serpent energy, they erected buildings that conducted the energy into a controlling element, with the effect of the plugs in the air vents having a resonance also upon the electromagnetic energy. We can see how it could have been specifically honed and finely tuned to create the effect. But let us leave the pyramid for a while and move to number six on our list of ancient secrets, the round towers. These round structures are worldwide and number in their hundreds and strangely they are linked to the serpent in almost every instance. Tall, elegant, round structures built by cultures as diverse as the Irish Celts and the early Christians to the Hopi Indians and Egyptians, all of which are linked to serpent worship. In Ireland there are over 65 round towers, many over 100 feet and claimed by academics to be no more than 1,000 years old. However, as with most Christian buildings, they are generally built upon much more ancient religious ground and indeed many of them can be proven to be older than first believed. Some even have churches built onto them as if to attach the church to the ancient serpent worship physically. Historian and writer Gradwell in the 19th century pointed out that St. Patrick and his followers almost invariably selected those sacred sites of paganism and built their wooden churches under the shadow of the round towers, then as mysterious and inscrutable as they are today. Some claim these structures were fire temples dedicated to sun worship and it is easy to see why, especially when we discover that sun worship is connected to serpent worship. Others claim them to be watchtowers which would relate nicely to the ancient Sumerian and Semite term for the serpent cult as watchers. In fact, Hargrave Jennings, author of Ophiolatreia, relates them to the obelisk, that ancient phallic and serpent derived pillar to the heavens. These towers are also found close by rivers, streams and holy wells and this not only raises the question of earth energy caused by the water course but also is very telling as serpent deities were always associated with watery places. Water was indeed the subterranean home of the serpent race and was the entrance to the underworld or other worlds which is where the trance state was intending to take you. But it is this association with water which seems to be important to such structures and in terms to earth related electromagnetic energy. There may indeed also be an important link between round towers and the Phoenicians who had similar structures dedicated to their rain and water deity Baal. There are thousands scattered across Sardinia, 
just north of the Phoenician city of Carthage, dating to at least 2,000 years before Christ. There are also those who believe that these round towers served as astronomical tools, like Stonehenge for instance, and this may be the case. The towers in Iran, called Radkan, meaning serpent, are thought to be these, and like the European towers of a much later date, they have conical caps. It has long been theorised that stone circles and ancient monuments are to be found on earth energy lines, known as ley lines. Many have theorised that these standing stones are magnetic acupuncture points upon the earth and that by aligning them strategically, the ancients were building the energy pathway for some unknown reason. The power found within the rocks, according to scientist Callahan, came from the millions of years of grinding and crushing of drifting tectonic platelets and that energy was trapped within the minerals that make up the various materials. Giving language to this theory, Callahan calls the positive and negative electromagnetic forces found within the rocks paramagnetism and diamagnetism, respectively. He claims that these forces were known in ancient times by the Chinese as yin and yang and by the Irish as fairies and leprechauns, the powers within the earth. It was Callahan who discovered the tachyon, which many had said did not exist. This is a particle that actually moves faster than the speed of light, something we now know others do via quantum entanglement. If mankind could utilise such a particle, it would actually be able to receive a message sent using the tachyon before it had been sent, thereby upsetting some fundamental laws of physics. Callahan states that we must treat rocks, stones and even soil as antenna collectors of magnetic energy waves. And it is this statement which resolves around the round tower theory as being earth antennas. However, it also points out that as fertile land is derived from volcanic activity, it too is an antenna, a flat one. Using this theory, he has gone on to show how practical applications can come from this research by improving the growth of plants by using the magnetism of the soil. He even claims that by building small round towers in the garden, we too can help growth of plants. Basing the hypothesis of his work in insect antenna and the capacity to resonate electromagnetic waves, Callahan hypothesized that the tall round towers were made to be earth antennas and that even similar buildings or structures around the globe could also be seen for the same reason. He believed before his time that the energy would be passed on to those meditating at the site. Of the towers tested in Ireland, Callahan found that the iron-rich rock that they were made from indeed helped this effect along. The towers made from materials such as limestone and granite were still, however, paramagnetic. Callahan goes on to show how the rubble within these towers, which has baffled people for decades, was truly there as a tuning implement. And all of this brings us to number 7 in our top 10 ancient secrets the harmonic alignments. One researcher, Boris Said, is quoted as having said, subsequent experiments carried out by Tom Daly in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid and in chambers above the King's Chamber suggest that the pyramid was constructed with a sonic purpose. Danley identifies four resonant frequencies or notes that are enhanced by the structure of the pyramid and by the materials used in its construction. The notes form an F-sharp chord, which according to ancient Egyptian texts was the harmonic of our planet. Moreover, Danley's tests show that these frequencies are present in the King's Chamber even when no sound is being produced. They are there in frequencies that range from 16 Hz down to a half a Hz, well below the range of human hearing. According to Danley, these vibrations are caused by the wind blowing across the ends of the so-called air shafts, in the same way as sounds are created when one blows across the top of a bottle. Strangely, we find that F-sharp is actually the resonant chord of the Earth and that the Egyptians knew this is startling. Mr. Said goes on in a separate interview to point out that a Native American maker of sacred flutes from Oregon 
also makes his flutes tuned to the key of F sharp. We may also note that as Callahan had previously pointed out, the importance of certain stones in connection to electromagnetism, the stones of these tuned passages were granite, a specific paramagnetic rock. Boris Sayed also points out that the coffer in the chamber itself is attuned to the frequencies of the pyramid. We should also note here that the vibrations were below those of the human ear at 16 hertz or less. This will become very important. In 1988, Dr. David Diemer, professor of chemistry and biochemistry at the University of California, made another chance discovery. Collaborating on a science meet arts project, Dr. Diemer attempted to find the vibrational frequencies of four base DNA molecules. Cutting all the technical science and bottom lining the whole thing, it was basically found that the pitch which shows up most frequently and asserted itself as a tonic was F sharp, having been discovered three times in each base collection. It turned out that the frequencies in base DNA harmonically ordered and perfectly in line with the frequency of the Earth, a secret we have only just discovered, and yet ancient man knew. It seems also that these particular frequencies turn out to be particularly pleasing to the ear, and indeed are thought to aid the healing process. Now, did the ancients know of this correlation between harmonic stones, the Earth, and even electromagnetism? Pythagoras gives us the answer from the 6th century before Christ. He described the stone as frozen music. His intuition apparently told him that the mathematics of frequency occurring in the planets, Earth and other cycles were in tune and indeed told a story. At the base level, our bodies understand this and at the heightened trance state, our minds do too. What the ancients did was to build structures which utilise the electromagnetic and harmonic effect, which work in unison with each other and us. They built in symbolism, power and grandeur, but also the universal harmonic and paramagnetic power. They then ritualised the whole thing into great and magnificent stories, fables, and even developed religions accordingly. Worldwide, and all relate to the serpent, a symbol of the wave form. All of this wonderful balance came about simply because the universe is striving for order. Over billions of years, the seemingly chaotic soup of the cosmos settled down into a wonderful equilibrium. Now, after millions of years of mankind attempting to understand this universal connection, we, in our modern era, have lost it. Instead, we have to rediscover it through hard, rational science what we shall call our left brain. The question is, will we be able to experience it again, as once our ancestors did? This leads us into number eight on our list, the universal frequency. According to scientists in the field of resonance, the fundamental frequency of the universe is F sharp. The same scientists tell us that interaction with this fundamental frequency under resonance conditions would result in the exchange of energy information. But more than this, tests appear to indicate that subharmonic resonance with the frequency of 1.855 Hz, or the Schumann frequency, actually resulted in the extraction of energy information from the universe. So, according to science, interaction under the influence of F-sharp actually allows the transference of energy, not only between individuals, but also from the very universe itself. But where is this energy really coming from, and what influences are occurring? The electromagnetic waves and particles, radio waves or energy in short, is coming from every angle of the universe known, from the sun, the stars and even the moon. Much of this energy is millions, if not billions, of years old. It is the most ancient of secrets. It acts in ways that are only just beginning to grasp, as we've seen in the discovery of the neutrino. 
Over the course of millions of years, this constant interaction of energy particle waves has plotted the course of human evolution. No wonder that ancient man believed his fate resided in the stars. The question also now has to be asked, as radio waves carry information provided by the sender, do any of the waves transferring energy to us carry any kind of information that we are capable of receiving? The answer has to be yes. Of course the energy waves carry information, that of the universe and from whence it came. It then imparts this information genetically and psychologically into us, as the F-sharp nature of DNA has shown. We have become balanced genetically with the resonance of the universe and should therefore be able to understand the information we are receiving, even if not at a conscious level, but certainly at a superconscious level. This superconscious level is where we find the other world, which is the place of knowledge of all the ancients. This knowledge is from the very universe itself. It is basically profound to those who experience it because it is God to them. It is the universal bank of knowledge that is growing and expanding all the time and in every possible conceivable dimension. It is claimed that this huge amount of information is constantly bombarding the human biosphere and that we do actually react accordingly, as we should after millions of years of evolution with these effects causing reactions within us. The electrical part of the human is the nervous system. It is this network of nerves which sends the signals to and from the brain, and it is the brain which is the cognitive functional part of our body. It is the brain which accesses the conscious, subconscious, and even then goes on to create the unconscious. According to Buddhist philosophers, nothing occurs in the realms without there being a cause, and we can see what that cause is. Consciousness had to have originated somewhere, but the nervous system of the body is vertically arrayed and is therefore in a perfect position, like the round towers, to act as antennas for the electromagnetism of the globe, and indeed universe. The body is the collector of the energy information that the universe is sending and sends the signals up to the brain via the vertically aligned nervous system, a perfect bio-machine. This connection, because it utilises the electrical energy of the body instead of the chemical connections, is instantaneous. The chemical connections are later on altered according to the information being gathered. The meditation techniques of our ancestors aided in the reception of these signals by calming the brain and bringing it into balance. For instance, our whole body is brought into rhythm with the universal frequency via breathing techniques utilised by most of the ancients. These meditation techniques can be seen in images of Kanunas and the Horned God, Buddha and hundreds of other ancient deities seated in the lotus position. With each breath, the electromagnetic field across the body is stimulated, modulating the transfer of signals continually up and down the spine. Certain drugs also affect the field. The use of drugs can cause a shift of phase in certain regions of the brain resonance. Drugs may also shift the brain slightly out of phase with environmental wave energies. Some psychiatric drugs actually cause an individual who is normally out of phase to be more in phase with the environment. Therefore, it simply has to be the case that drugs temporarily shift phase within the brain to match, or even mismatch, the wave particle effects of the universe. This interaction between the universe and humans is also affected strongly by gravity, 
which has also been categorised as a wave particle. This is seen on the larger scale also, for instance between the Earth and the Sun. The changes in the magnetic field of the Earth of periods longer than decades are the result of changes of the Earth's core. The Earth's core is known now to change in correlation with the solar core. They therefore interact and influence each other, like entangled particles on a very smallest level. If this is occurring on such a large scale with the force of gravity, then what effects are these forces having upon us? These relationships between planets cause earthquakes, volcanic eruptions and tsunami. These seismic effects are similar to the effects caused in humans, with outbreaks of war, famine, disease, population, migrations, etc. But there are more subtle effects caused by the constant stream of energy to and from the universe, and these cause smaller emotional traits within the conscious human being. Things such as the female association with the gravitational forces of the moon are an obvious example. It would seem from this information that consciousness is something that needs reappraising. We are conscious of our existence and the fact that we live, but we are not conscious of our greater role and place within a massive cosmic machine. Indeed, the superconscious state attained by the mystics who claim to be in touch with the universe and have done so for thousands of years could easily be argued to be true consciousness. To truly understand all of this, our ancestors had special people and these are number 9 on our top 10 list. Whoever it is, he or she must be dedicated, have a spiritual grounding and have been through an extremely long training period. This last requirement was essential to a soft landing on the pathway. It's simple really in that by using drugs only, the expectant traveller would simply come down with a bump. The trained traveller had simply been through the process gradually and with practice knew how to land. These people were the shaman of the tribe, seen across the world in all cultures from the very start. There is much dispute over the minor technicalities of the term shaman and the methods used. These disputes come from the fact that there are many ways of the shaman and many ethnic variances. There is no difference between them and let us say the Christian church, which has Protestants, Catholics and all manner of Orthodox and Evangelic in-betweens. They are, however, all still Christian and all emerged from the same basic systems. The same can be said of the shamanic world. They are called primitives due to the fact that they are original sources of religion, magic and medicine. Shamans are a worldwide phenomenon, appearing in Asia, the Pacific, the North and South America, Siberia, Russia, Scandinavia and Europe. There can be only two or three explanations for this worldwide existence. Either they were part of an ancient and universal system of knowledge and religion, or their very beliefs and methods are archetypal and held within each and every one of us. If the effect of entering the gateway to the other world is archetypal, as the evidence shows, then we could easily imagine that the phenomena could have erupted universally worldwide without outside influence. These people as humans enlightened to the internal sun and acutely aware of the movements of the exoteric sun were the original shining ones of humankind, which is why we find the etymology of the shining ones in every culture of the world. In fact, the impulse must have been so ancient that the question must be asked, was this enlightenment the spark of the cycle of human consciousness? Did the consciousness of humanity come from within our attempts to enter trance? and thus it spawned the global trek and establishment of seemingly similar religions around the globe. The Egyptian priest of the dead was a more refined version of the shaman. 
He was the one who would contact the other world through magical incantations and would make the way or path easier for the soul of the deceased. This is exactly one of the processes of the shaman. In essence, the Egyptian priesthood was simply nothing more than an evolved shamanic brotherhood or sisterhood. The complexities added into the initial shamanic rituals are just those, complex additions. The basic underlying principles of the gateway to the gods is the same. These similarities can be shown to be universal and it is these methods found from the Americas to the Middle East which shows that the shaman process was much more than archetypal phenomena. However, there is so much more of interest, including symbols that have stood the test of time of years and are very centre of modern secret societies today. Number 10 on our list is the five-pointed star. One of the world's most mysterious symbols, utilised more recently by Christian propagandists against pagan and Wiccan world, and yet probably one of the most holy of symbols ever to have been created, the pentacle. The very term itself, revealing in that pen, can actually mean either five or head, indicating a connection with the process which was seen and understood to be enacted within one's own head. The pentacle, as a five-pointed star, was used in ancient times and extensively as a talisman against witches in a stark reversal of our modern perceived usage. It was often worn in the folds of a turban or headdress to protect the subconscious mind from demons and conjurations. Its usefulness is thought to have emerged from the fact that it made up of three triangles, hence a trinity within a trinity, the most homely of numerical conceptions. And also the idea that it symbolises the figure of man with outstretched arms, like the crucified shaman and the fact that it is a symbol of eternity in that it can be drawn in one endless line. In later Christianity, it came to symbolise the five wounds of Christ and was the emblem that Sir Gawain of the Arthurian Romances had painted on his shield for protection. It was much later that Christianity utilised the symbol in an inverted position as a sign of the devilish arts. However, getting back to the origins, in Sumeria the sign was extensively used. From this moment onwards its associations are profound it is known as Ub, which is related to Ob, or snake. It also means corner, angle, nook, a small room, cavity or hole, obviously from whence serpents were said to emerge. This is also the cavity of the mind, or the womb of the Mother Earth, from whence we are reborn into and out of the other world. In conclusion then, our top 10 ancient secrets all point towards the ultimate of secrets, our place in the universe, the inner secrets of all time. Whether or not there is any truth to our consciousness being able to comprehend the immensity of existence is another thing. The fact remains that our ancestors believed it and it influenced our society in almost every sphere.